This is going to be verse by verse of Psalms chapter 7. And I'm going to title this, O Lord, my God. And I'm just going to use this to brag on God. So Psalms chapter 7 and verse 1. Shigion of David, which he sang unto the Lord, concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Number one, I want to say that our God is trustworthy. David said, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. And 2 Samuel twenty two thirty one says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. You have a Bible with his words, and his words have been tried. You can put your trust in what he says. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. So he is your defensive armor. You can trust in the Lord a lot better than you would man-made armor. Psalms 9.10 says, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. The Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And once you are in Jesus Christ, you can't lose Jesus Christ. Paul said to Titus, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God cannot lie. You can put your trust in him. He's trustworthy. Psalms 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some people trust in the things of this world to keep them safe and protect them from the enemy. But David said in Psalm 7, 1, In thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. So what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in your own abilities and talents? Or are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? But as you know, as we've talked about before, if you've been following these verse by verse of the book of Psalms, David is a type of the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble who will be running from the Antichrist. And back there in verse 1, it said, Shigion of David, which he sang unto the Lord, concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. And there isn't a person named Cush the Benjamite in the Bible, as far as I know. But many people think it could be a code name for Saul. And some say it is one of Saul's friends that may be informing Saul about David. Because, you know, Saul wanted David dead. But whoever he is, I believe he is David's enemy. And the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to have enemies. He is going to have to put his trust in the Lord. Only the Lord can bring him to the rock city and give him manna from heaven and feed him when the only way during that time to get food will be to take the mark or, and worship the beast. So they're going to have to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But for me and you today, when we look at these verses here in Psalm 7, we also have enemies. And many times it's other Christians. Many times it is people at work that want to tell on you for everything and just backstab you and talk about you behind your back, but the proper way to handle it is to turn it over to the Lord because only He is trustworthy. I can't trust myself with what I might do myself. I might flip my lid if I try to handle it myself. But if you have enemies, pray to God that He will save you from all them that persecute you. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. According to Second Timothy 3.2, you may not be getting your head cut off for the Lord, but there's other ways that you can be persecuted here in America. So trust in the Lord to deliver you during times of persecution. So Psalm 7, 1 through 2 says, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. In Revelation 13, the beast has a mouth of a lion. The Antichrist, he has a mouth of a lion. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul talks about being delivered from the mouth of a lion. Uh, the Lord delivered him from the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8 calls the devil a ro roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. So the devil is a lion, and he has a bunch of little lions in high places going around trying to tear you in pieces. And David said, Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver.
If there is anybody that I trust to deliver me from a lion, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to be a spiritual lion tamer is to have God on your side because if God be for me, who can be against me? And the one who overcame lives in me. And he is the line of the tribe of Judah. And so that makes me an overcomer. I can overcome the wicked one because of who's dwelling in me. Psalm 7, 3. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, David says. And David says, if I have done this. Uh, he could be referring to touching the Lord's anointed which would be King Saul. And that is why David didn't kill Saul, because he didn't want to mess with the Lord's anointed. But he's saying, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands. Now, he, David knows he hasn't touched the Lord's anointed. Uh, he's, he's talking to God, trying to get a prayer answered. So he says, If I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands. And, and David is approaching God with a humble spirit. He knows that he's an unclean thing. So he says, if there be iniquity in my hands, he knows it's possible that he could have done something wrong. Our hands have touched what we shouldn't touch. They've done things they shouldn't have done. And the only person trustworthy enough to confess them to is the Lord. He's the only person that you can trust to know your sin. Not a priest, not a psychic, not a mortal best friend on this earth but the friend that sticketh closer than a brother and that is jesus christ did you ever sit and think about that god knows all your sins and he's not told anybody about it he could ruin your life if he knew what you were thinking if he told everybody what you thought and what you did what you did even before you were saved all the horrible things you've done but God doesn't do that. He's not a gossip. He doesn't go around telling everybody what you've done or what you've prayed. Maybe you've doubted your salvation for years and you're a pastor. Uh, he's not gone around and told everybody that you've begged him to save you. Uh, maybe you were such a horrible person before salvation. You're ashamed of what you've done even before salvation he's not going around and told everybody what you did before salvation he's not gone and told everybody what you did after salvation he's trustworthy and he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother but david said oh lord my god if i have done this if there be iniquity in my hands wash your hands of your sin confess them before the lord James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So get your hands clean, and you can have a close fellowship with God. Psalms t or 1 Timothy 2, 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Can you lift up holy hands? So, David... He's talking about the Lord's anointed. He said, Oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands. He knows he hasn't touched the Lord's anointed with his hands. He's not done anything to Saul, even though Saul's been after him. Psalm 7, 4, If I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is my enemy. So David is saying, If I have rewarded him evil, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, then he deserves to have himself torn in pieces by the lines we were just talking about. And Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh his enemies to be at peace with him. Many times David approached Saul when he had the chance to kill him, and Saul was just nice to his face. He had peace with him even though he still wanted to kill him. But to his face, he didn't try to kill him. But David had chances to kill Saul and he never touched the Lord's anointed. Psalm 7, 5, Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor 
in the dust, Selah. Now, the word soul here is talking about physical life and death, not the soul that's going to go to heaven or hell. But David said, said let my mine honor, lay, let him lay mine honor in the dust. Uh, David knows he is dust. The Bible says, from dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. And the Lord told the devil, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So you know what that means? That means if you don't stay in fellowship with the Lord and let him protect you, you're going to be snake food. You're going to go back to dust. You is made out of dust. And the serpent's food is dust. Notice that David is praying and using his own personal conduct to try and request something from God. Uh, he knows he hasn't done anything to Saul. And he believes that the Lord is going to answer his prayer for that reason. And we don't do this today. For example, I'm not going to say, Now, Lord, I, I read my Bible every day this week, so do this or that for me. Uh, I'm not going to approach God that way. I've not done anything good enough for the Lord to answer my prayer. But things change in the Bible. God doesn't change, but how he deals with his people changes. David is making requests to God because of the fact that he didn't kill Saul. David said, lay mine honor in the dust, Selah. Now, every time you see the word Selah, it, is, it has the second coming close by in the context. And this time it comes in the very next verse. But next I want to say, O Lord my God is not just a trustworthy God, but he is a God with righteous anger. And the Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Jesus said, Whosoever is angry at his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. But God is angry with the cause. He is angry with the wicked every day. And one day he is coming back in his wrath and anger. Psalm 7, 6 says, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So as I said, you see the word Selah, and you're going to see the second coming close by. And that's what you see in this verse. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. That's referring to the second coming. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger is obviously a second advent reference. And the Lord is coming back with ten thousands of his saints. And he's going to come back as one awaked out of sleep. If you read in Psalm 78 and 65, it says, Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. So the Lord is coming back, and he's going to be angry. Psalm 7, 7, So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about, for their sakes therefore return thou on high. And this is a Jewish congregation. If the Lord doesn't come back for those Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, they won't make it. But one day they're going to realize who the Messiah is. They're going to realize it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 7, 8, The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. Once again today, uh, we aren't going to say this to the Lord. I'm not going to go to the Lord and say, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. Uh, because my righteousness is no good. Uh, my righteousness is filthy rags. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ gave me his imputed righteousness. But in the Old Testament, the Lord would look at the per personal righteousness of those Old Testament saints like he does David, uh, like he did Noah. He said Noah was a righteous man. Uh, Paul doesn't talk this way. He says, we're all unrighteous. But those Old Testament saints, they could get their prayers answered and get certain things because of their own personal righteousness. Uh, the Bible refers to Noah's righteousness, Daniel's righteousness, uh, Job's. So the way God is dealing with people is different throughout the Bible. This doesn't mean that the Old Testament saints gained eternal salvation or made it to the third heaven by their own righteousness. But still, it's, it's still different. 
Now Psalm 7, 9, I'll let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reins. And many times in the Bible when it says the wicked, it's referring to the Antichrist. He is that wicked one. Second Thessalonians calls him that wicked. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, and the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord will destroy the Antichrist in his anger. And David said, Let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. And you know when the Lord is going to slay the wicked? In the end. He will put an end to the wicked. And he knows who is wicked and who is righteous. And that is the Old Testament words for describing God's friends and God's enemies. They were righteous or wicked. Today we refer to them as saved or lost. And the, the righteous God trieth the hearts and reins. David says in Psalm 7-9, the Lord knows what's in your heart, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is a consuming fire, and if you're not saved, John 3.36 says, The wrath of God is abiding on you. He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. But, O Lord, my God is trustworthy. He has righteous anger. And number three, he is my defense. As I said, he is my shield and my buckler before. And Psalm 710 says, My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. Now today, if you're saved, you are upright spiritually speaking, because you have the righteousness of Christ applied to your soul, but your outward man, the flesh, isn't always right with God in your heart. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you when it comes to the fact that you can't lose your salvation. But if you continue in sin just because grace is greater than your sin, then you are in danger of the Lord taking his protective hand away and you'll be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And you'll still go to heaven, but you will suffer here and go to an early grave and get at the judgment seat of Christ and not have any rewards. But if you're saved and you walk with the Lord, you are the safest person on earth. My defense is of God. If God be for me, who can be against me? He saveth the upright in heart. God trieth the hearts and reins, so he knows what's in your heart. Psalm 711. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God has righteous anger. He will recompense tribulation to them which trouble you. He is your defense against the enemy who tries to persecute you. God can just snap, can't, um, he can just snap his fingers or just think a thought about his enemy and they'll be turned into dust. But he has weapons just for the fun of it. He has them just for kicks. And that's why I want to say, oh Lord, my God isn't only all those other things and so much more that I've already mentioned, but he is also a skull cracker. He is going to crack some skulls. Uh, Psalm 7.12 says, If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. Notice how the Bible is written in a way that a real man would love it. The Bible is not written for sissy men. And sissy preachers on TV will never mention these verses. Because they don't want to picture the Lord this way. They don't want to picture the Lord having weapons and being angry. And being a skull cracker. But if the wicked turn not. If they don't turn from their evil ways. Then he will wet his sword. Talking about he is going to sharpen it. He, even though he doesn't need it. He just does it for effect. And this is a sharp two edged sword. That proceeds out of his mouth. And you'll read about it in Revelation 19. When the Lord comes back to slay all the God haters. He hath bent his bow. A good cross-reference to this, Lamentations 2.4, He hath bent his bow like an enemy. He stood with his right hand as an adversary, and slew all that were pleasant to the eye. In the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion, he poured out his fury like fire. And many people think the Lord is just some puffy grandpa in the clouds who never gets mad. But these verses describe him as a character you should fear. And he is a character. And all these people you see today and you say, man, that guy's a character. But you don't know a more fearful, amazing, fearless, strong, almighty, unique character than the Lord. 
and sometimes you meet people and they just have something amazing about them and they have all these people with these amazing talents and abilities but don't forget that the lord made them and he is the ancient of days he was here before they were even born before their grandparents were born before the first men were born you can't find a greater character than the lord uh, he formed man out of the dust of the ground so all these men that you think are just characters they can't be more of a character than the lord psalm 7 3 7 13 says he hath also prepared for him the instruments of death he ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors uh, you talk about being dead meat that is people who persecute the lord's people they are dead meat and they are going to get the flaming arrows of the lord through their heart he hath also prepared for him the instruments of death and this is a threshing instrument because he is going to thresh the heathen in his anger he is our defense and when you're mowing the grass look down at the ground and see that grass blowing out that's what it's going to be like when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Habakkuk 3.12 Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. The Bible calls the Lord a man of war, and he is my defense. And if I'm going to war, I want to be on the guy's team who can take all the enemies out by himself you know how in school you would pick teams and it was the worst feeling ever to get picked last what's crazy is it seems like people always pick the lord last even though he should be picked first they'll choose their favorite preacher first they'll choose their talent and ability first they'll choose a big building and money first but then the lord gets chose later but if you have any sense You'll choose the Lord first. Psalm 714, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived a mischief, and brought forth falsehood. And this is that mystery of iniquity, the Antichrist. Paul calls him that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, when he said the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Psalm 715, He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. The Antichrist is going to make a pit, but he's going to fall in it himself. Like it says in the book of Revelation, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And the Lord is going to come back with a sharp two-edged sword, and the Antichrist is going to the pit. He's getting tossed into the lake of fire. Just like Haman was going to have somebody hanged, he ended up hanged. Just like Pharaoh wanted to drown the babies, he ended up getting drowned. Just like Judas got somebody killed, he done went and hanged himself. Psalm 716, His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. The pate is the, like the top of the head. And the fact that Jesus Christ is going to crush the head of the serpent and wound the head of the wicked is all through the Bible. You read about it when David killed Goliath with a stone and cut his head off. Sisera had his head stabbed through with a tent peg. The Lord died on a cross. And the cross was stabbed in the place of the skull. In the same place that he triumphed over principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. That's where he the, the cross was stabbed into, the place of the skull. And the Antichrist is going to get a head wound in the tribulation. Zechariah 11.17 says the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. The head of the wicked gets crushed because the Lord cracks some skulls. But next I want to say, O Lord my God is praiseworthy. Psalm 717 says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So David is praising the Lord for him cracking skulls. And those tribulation saints that get martyred are going to say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? 
You see, in the Old Testament, you're going to see David through these Psalms uh, talking about how he wants vengeance on, on his enemies and things like that. And then when you go to Revelation, you're going to see those tribulation saints talking about how they want vengeance on their enemies. And see, that shows that there is differences in the Bible. Because today, when somebody does me wrong, I'm not supposed to go to the Lord and say, God, do something to them. Get vengeance on them for me. No, no. I'm supposed to pray for them. I'm supposed to pray for my enemies. And pray for their well-being. Pray that they'll get saved. Pray that everything's going to be alright with them. I, I'm not praying for the Lord to crack their skull. So there's differences in the Bible. I don't know why it's that way, but the Lord obviously put it that way. But right before the Lord comes back at the second coming, this praise is going to be going on in heaven because he's praiseworthy. If you look at Revelation 19, 1 through 5, it says, And after all these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen and Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. So for everything good that happens, we should praise the Lord. For everything bad that happens, we should praise the Lord. Because he could have been, he could have been keeping us from something worse when he let that bad thing happen. But did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Did it ever occur to you that God is greater than all your problems? He is greater than any idol you ever had. And the good things anyone does could only be accomplished if God allowed it to happen. God is the only one worthy of praise. But, O oh Lord, my God is praiseworthy. But this has been a study, a verse by verse of Psalms chapter 7. And if you've made it this far and you're not saved, I want to share the gospel with you. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So the gospel, the glad tidings, the good news for you, is that Christ died. He died by shedding his blood. He died for your sins. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner and you need a Savior. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was able to rise again because He is not only the Son of God, but He's God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life and died on the cross for you so that you could believe on Him and have eternal life. So if you know you're a sinner and you know you're on your way to hell then come to the Lord Jesus Christ as that guilty sinner that you are and believe on Him today. And He will save you no matter what you've done, no matter who you are. He is a whosoever will God. He says in Romans ten thirteen, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So don't make it complicated. Don't listen to all the people that make it complicated. If you want to be saved, just get down on your knees right now and come to the Lord the best way you know how. Say, I know the gospel. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And I'm going to put my trust in you to save me so that I can be saved and have eternal life. But I hope that you'll be saved before it's too late.